Hey, you're listening to Education Through Music, the podcast. My name is Noah, and I'll be your host as we consider questions relevant to music in schools. This is our very first episode, but it won't be our last. Every month, we'll release a brand new episode exploring a different question of importance to music education stakeholders. We'll introduce some of these stakeholders as guests in each episode to join us in our discussion. We'll invite teachers, students, the families of students, school administrators, education researchers, and any number of other people interested in school music to bring their experiences and perspectives to you, the listener. Our goal is to enrich the discussion around music in schools, and to provide something of value to music education stakeholders. Each episode will bring new resources, inspiration, or perspectives related to music education. But first, a little backstory. As I mentioned, my name is Noah. I work as an instructional supervisor for a nonprofit organization called Education Through Music, based in New York City. Education Through Music partners with under resourced schools to provide music as a core subject for all children and utilizes music education as a catalyst to improve academic achievement, motivation for school, and self confidence. We believe that every child deserves access to high-quality music education taught by qualified and well-trained music teachers. My main role is to ensure that these teachers have the support they need to be successful. We also believe that music should support learning in other key areas, including math, science, and language arts, and that engaged parents and school communities are key to the success of students. So that's what we do and why we do it. But why does it matter? Our driving question for today's episode is, why do we need music in schools? I was lucky enough to sit down with several education through music teachers to help me ponder this question. With the first day of school right around the corner, it was as good a time as any to reflect on the roles music has served in our own lives and how our experiences as music students inform the ways in which we teach music to the next generation of music students. You're about to hear from Keith. He's a first year music teacher born and raised here in New York City. This is the story of how a new music teacher introduced him to the trumpet when he was in kindergarten and set in motion a series of events that would dramatically alter the course of his life, leading him to this point where he too will be a new music teacher. My school was, is a bilingual school, but it was just switching over to having arts classes and for the ceremony, they were um, kind of highlighting the new teachers and coming. And one of them was the music teacher. Kindergarten Keith was thrilled about it because I've never <laughs> seen or heard anything about it. Yeah. Um, so I went on up. She asked me what instrument I like to try. And it was, of course, the trumpet for me, mostly because of how, how shiny it was. <laughs> and, I remember you saying that when mm-hmm. we talked about why you chose your instrument. And so she asked me, do you want to play it? And I, I had no idea how to play a trumpet. Most kids just blow straight air through right, it. Right. And I hit a middle C spot on my first try. And so I didn't think anything of it. And so my family was waiting for the bus to go home because we lived in the area. 
And the, my teacher, Miss Sarah, runs out and she's like, Miss Diaz, Miss Diaz, which is my mother's name. She's mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, you're, I want to teach Keith privately. Can I do it? I think he has so much talent. And um, my mom was like, ah, you have to ask Keith and this and a third. Ended up, we, <laughs> we ended up um, doing private lessons outside of school, which by the way, she was like, I want to do this for free. Like I just, I'm really invested into Keith as a student. And that got me into the music advanced program at Juilliard. Wow. At the age of eight, mm-hmm. um, I got into multiple programs, Jazz at the Lincoln Center, Interlochen, Center for the Arts, um, and it was just history from there. This is Yovala, whose school music experience offered the opportunity to develop self-confidence and who intends to offer that same sort of confidence-affirming space to students this year. Without the music programs, um, I don't think I would have had a safe place to express myself. Mm. Um, Something that a lot of people don't know about me is that I'm neurodivergent. And um, I was diagnosed, like, much later in my life, like, after I, like, graduated and uh, like that was like my safe space like it was the one thing that I felt like I could excel at and like just like really be good at and now like I know that like oh that was me hyper focusing on something and like everybody thought that oh well she's really smart so then why is she just focusing on music why doesn't she do more math or science and I just thought well I don't know maybe I just don't like that or maybe I'm just not good at it Um, and then the more I got into music the more I learned about music technology and audio um, and got more into that like I realized there was never anything wrong with me. It was just, I couldn't see how that one thing related to the other things that I loved so much and I already felt confident about. Um, So yeah, I think it's important to instill like confidence in students that they can do music or um, show them how it relates to what they already feel confident about because it's just important to build up kids and just build up confident strong people so that the world is a little bit better. Now allow me to introduce Martha, who, having joined us all the way from Missouri, has a message to share with students about the importance of vulnerability and community. My school, I loved um, my music education growing up. So I had the same music teacher from kindergarten through eighth grade, Lisa Christensen in Springfield, Missouri. She was incredible. I know, big shout out, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) She's she's like listening, oh my God. (laughs) Um, She was incredible. She actually lived down the street from me because it was like, not like a super small community, but like it was Southwest Missouri, right? So it was definitely like a local community. And um, she played and accompanied us at the same time and she worked at another school as well but she was just wonderful and I feel like she gave us a great foundation but um, more importantly I also think she gave us a great like appreciation of music and also an appreciation of how to respect other people who are making music mm, okay so there was a, an element of community and and like interaction with other musicians as part of it absolutely and like i remember twice a year we had like one test which is that you would get up in the class and you'd like sing some little excerpt or something and we would spend like three classes beforehand practicing how to like respect people when they're singing and she was like if you laugh or giggle when somebody else is singing then you automatically fail the test there's only like one test in music right she's like we respect people getting up here and singing and that was always something that stuck with me to this day yeah is that going to have an impact on how you teach listening and, and that sort of thing in your class? Oh, absolutely. I think I want to put a big emphasis on the fact that like making art is one of the most vulnerable things you can do. And like vulnerability is good. And I think to instate that in children and be like getting up, singing, playing from your heart, um, you should respect what people are sharing with you. Here's Sky 
bringing us an important warning about the implications of cuts to music programs. You know, during your pandemic time, when you missed your art, you missed going to museums, you missed going to plays, you missed that entertainment. That if you take music out of schools, you That's will foster, you will foster <laughs> that. You will foster that lack of anything happening. Right. So don't do that because, you know, the musicians of today, we're, we're not eternal beings. We're human. We won't last forever. Unfortunately, a very real reality kind of dismal is people unfortunately pass away every day. If we aren't fostering the next generation to come through with those thoughts, we are doing a disservice to the future of art and music. Now meet Elena, who studied vocal performance in college and ran a successful vocal studio in Nebraska before moving to New York. Were it not for her school music program, she might not have ever realized where her voice could take her. I think that because singing, everyone in my family could sing, it was so normalized to me. I didn't understand that what I had was something special and it wasn't really affirmed to me. And so when I got into my choir program in school, um, I just received a lot of outside encouragement um, that just showed me that this was something that I really could pursue if it was what I wanted and it was what I wanted. Um, so that was very important to me being able to develop a voice and understanding that it really was something that was unique and special to me. So I started teaching actually after I got my bachelor's degree and I started my own voice and piano studio and I had it for seven years, um, taught so many students <laughs> in that time and a really awesome thing that I was able to do with my performance experience was I was able to use that to help my students then become performers. I would like to bring that same culture of music as a gift for ourselves that we love so much that we want to give it to other people. And obviously we're going to have two concerts per year. And I think that my performance background is going to help me to prepare those students and help them to give a really good performance that they will feel proud of. And that's gonna increase their confidence and just after they give a good performance, they just feel so good about themselves. And I love seeing that in students. And I'm really excited to use those skills in the classroom and getting those kids ready for that and to see their reactions. This is Josh. They're beginning their second year in the classroom and they draw from a pretty comprehensive, multifaceted music background to build experiences for students that break down the barrier between producers and consumers of music. You'll hear what I mean in a second. Um, I like to basically like show my students that it's not like an us and them thing. Like we are all participants equally in this like thing called music, you know, like these composers that we put on this like pedestal, like they were in the same position that we were in at some point. And like we can be them, like we are in some ways them. We're all just like people that are participating in music. So like what they have to say is like not necessarily any more important or valuable to like culture and society than what you have to say. And I, I think that's like an inspiring message to a lot of uh, kids that they're that are looking at like the Grammy Awards and seeing these like profound and proficient people and thinking like that can never be me, but like they were you, you know. Right. Um, I guess looking more broadly and taking a step back at what the purpose of schools is, um, is to like prepare you to enter culture and to enter community. Um, and I think there's been a large focus in the past like 20 or 30 years on preparing you for the workforce and the workforce only, mm -hmm. where we're not acknowledging that being like a person that's in a community and in a culture has more than just like showing up to a job and going home. Um, and I think we're starting to regard that there's value to like creating and contributing to things that aren't necessarily paying your bills or like the thing that you clock into every day. And there's also a value to appreciating those things. And music does all of that. Same thing with visual arts, same thing with theater. Um, 
they give you pieces of life and community that are not necessarily like just about you showing up to a job and paying your bills. There are things that make life beautiful, that make life like, it's a little too dark, but like worth living, <laughs> I guess, you know? <laughs> um, it's, it's more of the fruits, I guess, you know? Meet Alfredo, who essentially grew up in a music classroom at home, but leaned on the availability of a music program at school as well in order to broaden his understanding of music to encompass more than just what he was hearing and playing at home. He is beginning his second year of teaching as well. My father came to America to catch up with his mom with the intention of buying a Fender guitar Mm -hmm. and then heading back. He was just going to work enough to buy a Fender guitar and head back. And that trip became, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he... And he stayed. He stayed, he stayed. He brought my mom <laughs> over. He brought my sister over. Um, and he, he continued to play music for a while. Um, he had a band uh, that was, like, it was... It was it made a decent impact in, like, the New York Latin rock scene. Um, but uh, he invested a lot of money in, like, equipment and stuff like that, so... The house was just litter of instruments, and you pick it up just because it's there. Um, so I was exposed to that for a, for a while, and then when I got to high school is when I really like, jumped in. But uh, you know, because we came from like this like trash metal kind of uh, scene, mm-hmm. like jazz and stuff like that. Like learning instruments, like traditional instruments, was in uh, a big thing. But uh, my brother played saxophone in high school, and I wanted to get into that world too, so I took up saxophone. Eventually, I switched over to electric bass, and then I just kept going. Our final guest for this episode is Buell. He brings us some reflections on the familiar and the unfamiliar when it comes to the music that students bring into the classroom. Sometimes the overlaps with what the music teachers bring into the classroom occur where you least expect them. Engage in what you're doing. What you're doing is relevant to you. So that part, I can't, I I will never ever try to deter you from that. Mm -hmm. I feel like my goal is like, I'm like a shepherd. So we're, and I'm, I'm shepherding you by saying, I am this, you're listening to this. Listen to how this relates to what you're listening to. And um, I, that's what happened last year a lot of times. And then also I'm, I'm surprised with the things that they take from my generation mm. and make their own. That's what fascinates me the most about yeah. that kind of stuff is what do you, what, what, I mean, I could sit and play you a playlist of all my favorite songs and you being eight or nine years old, you might humor me by listening to it. Right. <laughs> but I think the thing that started to fascinate me the most last year was that I'd be like, you guys, are li- that's your, you want to listen to that song? So the things that they, the things that they take from 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 past generations and then make their own and then move on that's the thing that I, I find fascinating and I think even moving forward I'd like to explore that even more is just is by because we talked about that in the in the academy of of accepting their choices giving them the choice but also um, uh, respecting their choices and mm-hmm. saying wow I I went, I walked into class on the day before school ended and everybody is singing this Kate Bush song. Mm, Running up that hill. Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, what? (laughs) Why, why, what, what? I love this song. Right. Where where you guys get, like, not, it's not even like, I felt like embarrassed because I'm like, where are you getting this from? Like, and they're like, it's on this new show. And I'm like, that. And they and everybody loves it. Yeah, the kids love that song. It's a, and it's a beautiful tune. song. Man. It's a great song. Yeah. And come to find out, she didn't get a number one hit 
Until now. Until now, yeah. The thing that struck me in both having these conversations and then listening back to them after the fact is the idea of the music teacher as an indispensable link in a chain that stretches across time and space. Music is one of those things that you can't learn entirely from a book. There is a human connection that is prerequisite to picking up any instrument or learning how to use one's voice to sing. There are countless volumes of notation out there that convey instructions for pieces of music, but they're incomplete without the guidance of a teacher connecting sign to sound. And that's just for notated music. There's even more music out there that is only transmitted orally. So when that chain breaks, the music is lost. Strengthening the chain, adding as many strong links as possible, is the only way to preserve the tremendous cultural output we've already got and guarantee still more new cultural output for us to experience in the future, like Sky said. As Keefe's story reinforced for me, sometimes that teacher, just in being there to form that connection and recognize the resulting spark, can make a tremendous difference in a child's musical development and life. Sometimes just being there is all a music teacher needs to do in order to build a protective barrier around students whose brains work differently, long enough for them to build the confidence to navigate a world that doesn't always affirm difference the way it should, uh, as I was reminded in my conversation with Yohola. Every teacher of music connects their students to their own teachers in a cross-generational sequence that goes back as far as music goes. And music goes back really far. This impulse that we have as humans to create and take part in culture is one of the most foundational aspects of our being. It's part of the glue that held together the earliest social bonds, and it works in much the same way today. If I see a band t-shirt that is familiar to me, I know that its wearer and I have something really meaningful in common. This group of people with whom I spoke is obviously pretty biased towards strongly positive feelings about music, since we're all music teachers. Uh, but I would venture that most people have some sort of personal relationship with music. Even among people who wouldn't necessarily call themselves musicians, these relationships can be deeply meaningful. In building music programs in schools, teachers not only connect their students to these chains that stretch forwards and backwards in time, they also offer a space for students to discover their connections to their peers and the world around them more generally. Students have a chance to practice vulnerability and membership in a community that treats vulnerability as a positive experience and an opportunity to grow, like Martha said. They get a chance to develop a set of skills that don't have to be tied to a paycheck to be valuable, like Josh said. They get a chance, as Buell mentioned, to discover the overlap they share with an older generation when it comes to what they're listening to and appreciating. They have another avenue for affirmation and self-actualization that they might not get elsewhere, as Elena reminded us. And like Alfredo said, even students who are already deeply immersed in music outside of school can encounter music that they might not otherwise have ever heard, as long as they have access to a robust music program. In doing all of this and more, I think music in schools is one of the most important things we could be talking about right now. So I thank you for hanging out and listening. So concludes episode one of Education Through Music, the podcast. 
I hope you've enjoyed listening and meeting these fantastic music teachers, however briefly. If you care to hear more, be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you do your podcast listening so you won't miss the release of episode two, which is on its way. If you have any thoughts on the show, positive or constructive, please feel free to reach out to nteachy, T-E-A-C-H-E-Y, at etmonline.org. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time.